welcome to Family Worship Center Online Resurrection Weekend Services. Uh, I want to share with you some very hopeful news, the reason that we're here, the reason that we celebrate the way we do, especially on this weekend. In Luke 24, chapter 1, or I'm sorry, Luke 24, yeah, verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And I don't know about you, but that's the best news I've ever heard in my life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the risen Lord and Savior, God. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to gather. Even though we're not physically together, God, we are still one body. We are the church, God. We praise you. We honor you. And we pray right now, God, that the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart as we enter into worship and praise of you, God, are pleasing and acceptable to you. God, we, we praise you once again, God. And we hope that this time blesses you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. I hope you have a great weekend and enjoy the service. I was buried beneath my shame. That kind of weight It was my tool Till I made And I was breathing the night Her life And all my faith
of every man the weight of all I've done is nailed into your hand Oh, your love made for me Oh, your love and crimson strength
Jesus Christ, my living I see his wounds, he is 
his hands, his feet My Savior alone The curse of the tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down and chose his tomb The entrance in by him he stood Messiah still and all of our strength, our fortress, and that you, God, are the Alpha and the Omega, God, that you go before us. And God, when we come to the end, you will be there waiting for us. God, we praise your holy, righteous name because you are mighty, God, and you're mighty to save. You're merciful. 
you're gentle, you're kind, you're gracious to us. And God, we honor you, we praise you. On this resurrection weekend, we celebrate that you are alive. You're alive not only in the universe, you're alive in our hearts. That greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. God, our hope and our faith and our trust is solely placed in you. God, we don't trust in our own wisdom, our own ingenuity. God, we trust fully in you and your power to sustain us, to lead us, to guide us. God, we trust you in the good times. We trust you in the bad times. God, we lay our faith at your feet and we trust solely in you because you are alive. You conquered death, hell, and the grave, and you promised you would never leave us nor forsake us, so our faith is fully placed in you, Jesus. And we worship you, our King, our soon coming King, that God, one day you're gonna return to receive your followers. We pray, first of all, we're ready to meet you. And that God, that we are looking forward to seeing you face to face. God, we are looking forward to being in your presence. And we know you're coming as soon. May our hearts be ready and pure and righteous. Hallelujah. So you have your eyes closed right where you're at. Can you just make sure your heart is pure and holy and righteous? To get there, only Jesus Christ can get you there. Only Jesus Christ can cleanse you. Only Jesus Christ can make you holy and righteous by what he did on the cross for all of us. If you need forgiveness right now, can you just pray, God, forgive me, cleanse me of my unrighteousness. God, wash away my iniquities. Make my heart pure and holy and righteous in your sight. Oh God, cleanse us, purify us. We repent of our sins and we place our faith solely in you, Jesus. We trust in you. May we be ready to meet you. May all, God, all sin and iniquity be washed away through the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jesus, we want to remember what you did for us. Before you arose from the grave, you were tortured, you were beaten, you were stripped, and you were crucified. And you did it willingly for our salvation. And you told us never to forget your sacrifice. And the way you taught us how to remember it is through communion. That we take a piece of bread that represents your body and we partake of it signifying our union with you and we take a cup and we drink it in remembrance of your blood that was offered for our salvation God we want to do that now in your name we want to remember the cross hallelujah hallelujah and if you're at home I hope that you've got the message to prepare for communion with some crackers, some juice, and to partake of it together as a family, to celebrate the cross. You know, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ includes remembering the cross. Sin and death entered our world because Adam and Eve willfully partook of the forbidden fruit. Today, we do the opposite. We partake of communion as an act of obedience. Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit as an act of disobedience. We partake of communion as an act of obedience. And through communion, we declare our union with Christ. Through communion, we declare that we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through communion, we declare that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God decreed that from the foundation of the earth that the penalty for disobeying him 
is death. And God told Adam and Eve that if they disobeyed him, they would die. And they disobeyed him. And not only did Adam and Eve disobey them, all mankind, including you and I, have disobeyed God. The Bible clearly says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God decreed also that the only way out of our sinfulness, the only way out of judgment, the only way out of condemnation because we disobeyed Almighty God, the only way out is if there was, if there's a perfect sacrifice, a perfect person, a sinless person that would offer their life for our life, their blood for our blood. And that's why Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven. He came into our world, lived a sinless life, a perfect life. And then he stepped up to the cross and offered his blood for our blood. And then as he ascended to heaven, he offered to God his blood as a substitute for our blood. And that's why the Bible clearly says if we believe in Jesus Christ, then God accepts his blood as an offering instead of our blood. And that we are forgiven, we're freed because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. That's why Jesus, while he was on the cross, the last three words he spoke were, it is finished. You might think, what was finished? The full price of our salvation was paid in full on the cross. We don't attend church. We don't listen to messages. We don't give and help those in need to earn salvation. Jesus Christ paid the full price. And Jesus commanded us to celebrate communion so that we don't forget that Jesus paid the price for our spiritual freedom, for our salvation, for our transformation. And so before we partake together, can you bow your heads again and let's just pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us. When Adam and Eve sinned, you could have just annihilated them and started over, but you decided to redeem mankind. And Jesus, you came into our world to save us, to change us, to redeem us. You offered your life in place of our life, your blood in place of our blood. And you told us that if we believe in you and trust in you, that your blood will cover our iniquity. And that's why we repent of our sins and we place our faith in you, Jesus, for salvation. And we partake of communion to remind ourselves of the price that you paid to set us free. We are so thankful that your blood covers us. We are thankful to live in America because we are physically free to live where we want, to do what we want. And that freedom came with the price of blood, many, brave men and women gave their life on the battlefield and served in our military to keep us free. But Jesus, you fought death, hell, and the grave, and your blood set us spiritually free. And we partake of communion in remembrance of you and in honor of you and in celebration of what you have done for us. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Chapter 11, the Bible says, and when he had given thanks, Jesus broke the bread and said to his disciples, take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat the bread in remembrance of his sacrifice for your salvation. And in the same manner, Jesus took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take it and drink it in remembrance of his sacrifice for your salvation. God, we thank you. God, we thank you for saving us, for changing us, healing us, delivering us. 
God, we owe it all to you on this resurrection weekend. We celebrate your life in us, that you, God, are our living hope. We praise you, Lamb of God. Thank you that we are free from sin, from fear, from anxiety, from depression. You have delivered us through your blood and we thank you, we praise you. And now I pray for our spiritual family all across this city and in the surrounding communities. Those that are in their homes with families, we pray you will bless every person. All of our single men and women, God, that are alone right now, we pray you will bless them. You will strengthen them. Fill their house with your presence, with your glory, God. Let them sense your nearness right where they're at, God. Because you arose from the dead that you can be in each and every one of our homes. And we turn, God, every house into a sanctuary where you are praised. Not only bless our family, but our brothers and sisters in Christ all over our city, the churches around our city, the pastors and the worship teams and the leaders and the, and, and, and the congregations. God bless all the followers of Christ throughout Pueblo, Colorado and the surrounding communities. I pray you would keep sickness away, God. I pray you will bless every family, strengthen them, bless them spiritually, emotionally, physically, God. Let our homes be filled with peace and your presence, God. I pray that every home, God, would be at peace, Lord, that there wouldn't be any domestic violence in our homes, God. Lord, I just pray for peace in every house. I pray for individual needs. If there's anyone that's struggling with an addiction, God, I pray you would set them free. That, God, you would remove addictions, God, from cocaine and heroin and marijuana and alcohol, God, and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. God, set your people free. Those that feel fearful and abandoned, God, give them the comfort that your presence can give, Lord. Cover them with your peace. We pray against the coronavirus that you will just end it. You will destroy this virus. Those that are sick, we pray you will raise them up and that you will heal them. Protect our doctors and our nurses, God, and all those in the medical field. Protect our police officers, God, uh, the, our, our DOC workers, and God, all those that are on the front line, God, the first responders, Lord, I pray you will protect them, God. Protect those who are vulnerable, Lord. Those that are at risk, God, I pray that you will just put a shield of protection around them. Heal our family members that are sick, that need a healing touch, God. Touch David Nunez, Lord, I pray for strength and healing, God, in his foot. Lord, I pray for Margie Wyatt, heal her, and Leslie Burkerfeld, God, heal her, and Dee Dickerson, serenity, God. Lord, strengthen serenity, God. I pray, God, that you will strengthen her body, Lord. I pray for Charlotte and John Arum, Lord. Heal John, God. We pray against cancer, Lord. We pray for Cindy Johnson, Lord. I pray for healing in her body. God, touch all your people right now, we pray. God, minister to them. Touch every follower of Jesus Christ. Strengthen them. May they, God, keep their eyes steadfast in you. Although we haven't been able to meet together as a family, I pray that we would stay strong in you, God, at home. We would pray. We would read your word, Father. God, we pray, Lord, for those that may not know you that are listening. May today be the day where they accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. And that, God, that they could have the blessed assurance that, God, that you, Lord, are in their life. We worship you. We praise you. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is my story. Oh, God, thank you, Jesus. This is my song. Just sing it with us. Praise Him, my Savior, all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praise Him, my Savior.
Christ. Amen. 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 Give an elbow bump to those that are near you. God bless you. We love you. We miss you. And we'll see you soon. God bless. Praise God for Resurrection Weekend. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Thank you so much for watching. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you're new to watching, you may ask, why do you do church? Jesus' instructions were to go and make disciples. At Family Worship Center, our very mission is to change the world by making lifelong followers of Jesus Christ who love God and love people. That's why we teach, we preach, we share our faith, we do life groups, vacation Bible school, worship and picnic in the park, we greet, we sing, we do Angel Tree, Samaritan's Purse, the bus ministry. We give to missionaries around the world. We give to the poor. We support cooperative care. We help single moms repair their cars. We support widows. We help pregnant mothers through a caring pregnancy center. We deliver groceries. We make phone calls. We pray with people. We give to the homeless. As of late, we're doing Zoom Bible studies, videos, live stream, and Facebook Live. That's why we're helping during this pandemic to deliver groceries, help families in need with food or errands. And Dee and Donna and their ladies have made over 200 face masks for people. All of these are ways to share the gospel and the love of Jesus. Each of you who give faithfully each week, help us fulfill the great commission that's so much bigger than we are to go and make disciples. Thank you for your generous giving. Pastor Dave and the deacons team carefully and wisely use your money for the gospel. Just an aside, several people are putting a red ribbon or tape or cloth around their doorways to symbolize Passover. You can read about this in the book of Exodus about how the blood on the doorpost, they were passed over by the death angel. Just a reminder as we get back to giving, you're able to give online. Go to fwc.life forward slash give. Enter your routing number, your check number, and the amount that you want to give. Or you can download that app, and you're welcome to mail in your tithes and your offerings. Let's bow in prayer. God, Resurrection Sunday is the same in that the finished work on the cross of Jesus Christ destroyed Satan and made him a defeated foe. You are alive and living in our hearts, our homes and our lives. God, we pray for the persecuted church and remember them in their chains. Even if we've been closed up in our homes, we've never resisted to the point of shedding our blood. Father, after these few weeks, we never want to take our religious freedom for granted here in America. This discomfort is painful, God, but it's a clarifying gift. Thank you, God, for those who continue to give faithfully of their tithes and their offerings. I ask, as you promised, that you would open the windows of heaven's heaven and pour out a blessing on them that there wouldn't be room enough for. I pray blessings over each home, each family. God, that you would minister peace and wholeness and strength and healing to them. Hide us all from evil. Use what is given to help fulfill the mission to make lifelong followers of Jesus Christ here in Pueblo and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We miss you and love you. Hey, Family Worship Center. I'm your children's pastor, Brandon Pratt. I just want to let you know all the things we have online. Just because we haven't met in person doesn't mean our kids' ministry has stopped. We have YouTube channels with all of our lessons and full services and worship all together. We're also posting those on Facebook. Also on Facebook, every day we are posting activities for your kids to do. We're also doing the whole Zoom life group thing. This is a whole new experience for us, but we're really getting the hang of it and really getting some awesome life groups going. And you can get to all of these things through one spot, 
fwc.life slash kids. We'll have all of our information. And don't forget to join us this week to remember that he has risen. Hey, Family Worship Center, uh, Pastor Jason here. Just wanna share all the opportunities we have online um, for students to, to connect with us. Uh, Wednesday nights are, are Zoom groups. Uh, we have about three or four going. Um, if you are interested in that, just check out um, the fwc.life webpage. Uh, click on students and you'll see a sign up for those. Um, also, we're doing our, our Friday night uh, services. Um, uh, worship said and, and, a, and a great message um, each week. Um, if you wanna check those out. Um, and also, I just, I wanna thank you guys for, um, for the opportunity that we have uh, to minister to your students. and. and during this time, we just we want to help them grow spiritually. So, if you have any ideas, any thoughts, any anything that uh, that you can share with us as, as opportunities we have to reach your kids, love to hear it. Uh, God bless, and remember, He's risen. Hey everyone, this week is our virtual spring life group launch. We have over 20 groups starting on the Zoom video conferencing platform online. We hope you'll take advantage and stay connected during this unusual time. If you're interested in more information, if you want to sign up for a group, go to www.group.life. There's a video there explaining how you can be a participant, and then there's the list of life groups that you can sign up for. Hey, welcome to Family Worship Center at home. Happy Resurrection Weekend. Chris and I sure miss seeing you and uh, worshiping the Lord together here at Family Worship Center. I'm praying that this coronavirus will end soon and that we can once again gather together here in the name of the Lord. After spending two weeks uh, in isolation, here's what a phrase that epitomizes what I'm thinking right now. I spent two weeks hanging out with myself and I am so sorry to every person I have ever spent time with. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I hope you're doing well. Uh, and uh, I hope you're using this time of isolation as an opportunity to really be transformed by Jesus Christ, that allowing him to transform you, especially from fear to faith. There's a lot of fear out there right now, and on this resurrection weekend, I want to look at the 11 disciples who were transformed from fear to faith through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're right now in a pit of fear, anxiety, or depression, I believe the power of the resurrection will lift you out. Now, as we look at the disciples in uh, their experience with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I've divided their journey from fear to faith into seven chapters. And the journey begins with the thought of battle ready. Uh, after they partook of communion together, they walked to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the garden, Jesus prayed, and he asked his disciples to pray with him. But instead, they chose to sleep. Finally, Jesus woke them up and said, the hour has come. Now, when Jesus said the hour has come, I believe most of the disciples thought that the hour meant the time when the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Rome uh, would come to pass and that Jesus brought them to Jerusalem uh, to confront uh, the Roman Empire and they were battle ready. They didn't understand that uh, Jesus was speaking about uh, that the hour has come when the kingdom of God is going to destroy the, the, the rule and the reign and the power that Satan had on mankind. When the soldiers arrived, Peter, who was armed and packing a sword, uh, fired the first shot, or may I say, he swung the first sword, and he cut the ear off of the high priest's servant. Now, I'm sure he was aiming to decapitate him, but he missed. And what happened next was more shocking than Peter's bad aim. Jesus didn't fight back. Jesus allowed them to arrest him, to bind him, and to carry him away as their prisoner. As Peter and the disciples watched the soldiers take Jesus away, their hearts believed it was over, that they had spent three and a half years of action-packed ministry, watching blinded eyes open, watching the, the, the lame walk, and it all ended with a non-resistant arrest. Their dream 
of Jesus being their savior, their dream of Jesus being the Messiah in their heart had died. And because of that, we come to their next chapter of their journey from fear to faith, and that is they begin to hide in fear. In John 20, verse 19, it says, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. When Jesus was arrested, they ran in confusion. They hid in fear. Peter himself, one of the uh, leaders of the disciples, denied that he even knew Jesus. Now, I believe Peter was a brave man, but I believe he didn't feel like the risk of, it, of connecting himself with Jesus was worth it because in his eyes, Jesus was an arrested Messiah and that it wasn't worth risking his life for. If he would thought it was worth risking his life for, Peter was a, was a very brave man. It just shows us the depth of fear and the depth of disappointment and the depth of, of lostness and, and, and confusion that was running through his mind as we move forward even to the crucifixion that only one of the uh, disciples showed up, John. The rest of the disciples remained hid and, and, and they were hiding in fear. They did not look at the cross as anything glorious like you and I do. In their minds, the cross did not mean salvation. It did not mean redemption. The cross did not mean forgiveness. To them, it only meant the death of a friend and the death of a dream. Now, I want to leave the disciples in hiding for a moment and skip to the very last chapter of their journey from fear to faith. I want to move forward about 20 to 50 years and look at the end of their lives. How did their lives end? When you look at the disciples' lives, when you come to the end of their life, you find something totally different. When we left them hiding in fear of the cruci at the crucifixion and the arrest of Jesus, when you skip forward 20 to 50 years, at the end of their life, they all willingly laid down their life for the belief that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is the Messiah. Let me show you how uh, many of them died. Some of, some of their deaths are recorded in the Bible. Some of them are from the first century uh, Christians who wrote about the disciples. Peter was crucified upside down for his belief that Jesus arose from the dead. Historians tell us that he was going to be crucified like Jesus, but he says, I'm unworthy to die in the way my master died. And they chose to crucify him upside down. James, the brother of Jesus, threw, was thrown from the temple when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. Bartholomew was beat to death by a whip for his belief that Jesus arose from the dead. And you could go on down through Andrew and Thomas, Matthias and James, Philip, Simon and Jude. All of them died in their belief that Jesus arose from the dead. If they all had an epitaph at their, at their gravesite, it would be, we willingly gave our lives for the belief that Jesus is alive. He is, a, he is man's only hope for salvation. Now, this doesn't sound like the scared disciples who went, run, who went running to hide when Jesus was, was crucified. When you come to the end of their life, it's a 180 degree about face. What changed their lives? What in the world turned them around? I think we have to go back to chapter three in their journey from fear to faith, and that is that he is risen, that Jesus Christ arose from the dead, that on that early Sunday morning when Jesus arose from the dead and they heard about it, their doubts and fears that hit them so hard were deleted in an instant. When they heard an angel say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. That transformed their life from despair. If Jesus wasn't uh, resurrected from the dead, I believe that they would have, we would have just, uh, they would have just died in despair and, and, and anxiety and fear. But he arose from the dead. When we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find a list of people that Jesus appeared to 
after he was resurrected from the dead. He didn't just appear to one person in his basement, you know, and, and, and just gave him one vision that, our, that all of Christianity doesn't hinge on the revelation of one man. It says over 515 people saw Jesus alive and well after he was tortured, beaten, crucified, and buried in a tomb. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. So we see when you add up the number of people, there are over 550 individuals. There's men and women. There's believers and doubters. There's the, he, ministered, he, he revealed himself to groups, to individuals. He, he showed up indoors and, and outdoors in broad daylight. He talked with people. He ate with people. Even Thomas, one skeptic, uh, said, I won't believe until I see him with my own eyes. And Jesus invited him to touch his, his nail holes in his hands. And, and, and Thomas believed and, and, and he gave his life for the belief that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Now, we are hard on Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. But we got to remember that once he saw Jesus, he gave his life for the belief that Jesus is alive. You see, the resurrection changed everything. 515 of them saw Jesus alive and well, and it transformed their lives. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are followers because of their transformation of what they saw, that Jesus arose from the dead. Max Lucado said, because of the resurrection, everything changes. Death changes. It used to be the end, but now it's the beginning. That the resurrection changed everything. It changed the meaning of the cross. The cross, up until Jesus died on the cross, was just a place of death, a place of despair. It was the end. Now we look at the cross as a place of hope, a symbol of love, a symbol of forgiveness, a symbol of grace. The disciples were changed because Jesus arose from the dead. And we celebrate his resurrection today. As we move on to chapter 4, we need to look at the impact the resurrection had on the disciples. It transformed their lives. Now, I've been pastor and family worship center here for uh, 30 years and you that have been with me for over 10 years have heard one or two of my stories repeated uh, a couple times. And I'm as guilty as charged. I have repeated some of my stories. But some of the things that God has done in my life, I just can't stop talking about. God has done some amazing things in my life, and I share those stories from time to time. But I'm among good company because when you look at the disciples and you looked at when they preached and when they shared... When you look at the book of Acts, which records the first 20 years of the New Testament church, every recorded sermon, every recorded message has the story of the resurrection. They never left out the story of the resurrection because that was the cornerstone of their faith. The, that Christianity is, is, rises or falls on the, on, on the resurrection. That if Christ didn't overcome death, hell, and the grave, then, then, then we have no hope. The hope we have is from the resurrection. Even when Paul wrote to a New Testament pastor named Timothy, Timothy was discouraged he was overwhelmed. He was frustrated as a, as a young pastor. And Paul wrote the book of 2 Timothy to encourage him. And listen to how Paul encouraged him. He said to Timothy, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to the gospel. Timothy, he's, Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, you might be struggling with the challenges and the difficulties that you are facing, but remember Jesus is alive. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will strengthen you, he will empower you, he will lead you, he will bless you. And that's truly our hope today in this current pandemic 
again, as I mentioned, a lot of people are fearful and they're looking for something stable and consistent. Uh, let me tell you, our hope is in the resurrection. Our hope is in a living Savior, Jesus Christ. And because He lives, we have hope. Because He lives, we live. Because He lives, we have eternal life. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're sitting in your living room, this is a wonderful time to say amen, hallelujah, and praise the Lord that He is alive. Let's go back to the disciples. In their journey from fear to faith, we're on what I've divided into seven chapters, chapter five. Why does the resurrection matter? Why is the resurrection so important? What does it, what does it change as far as the resurrection? Well, here's some meanings of the resurrection. The resurrection means we are not alone. You may feel isolated in your house right now, but you are not alone alone because Jesus arose from the dead he can be with you right now in your house we are not alone we have hope beyond the grave that death is not the end as I read earlier of Max Lucado death is not the end it is the beginning of eternal life if I didn't have the hope of the resurrection I would probably be clinically depressed because I've done hundreds of funerals of people that I've loved and, and, and have been close to me and close friends that I've, that I, that I've done their service. And, and if I didn't have the hope of the resurrection, if I didn't have the hope that I would see them again, if I didn't have the hope that I knew that they were with God, I would be so discouraged and depressed the finality of death without the resurrection. But because Jesus arose from the dead, it means that we have hope beyond the grave. We also have the power to face life's struggles, life difficulties, life's challenges. It means that God is in control. It means we can be forgiven. It means that new life is available in Jesus Christ. But I believe the most important meaning of the resurrection is that the resurrection means we can know God. Because he lives, we can know God. John 17, verse 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that you may know, that, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you. In other words, that mankind, sinful humans, who have been disobedient to God, but yet came to the cross and repented of their sins and believed on Jesus Christ can know God. That would not be possible without the resurrection. Without Jesus Christ coming out of the tomb and overcoming death and hell and the grave, knowing God would not be a possibility. The greatest meaning, the greatest blessing of the resurrection is that you and I, and know God. You see, Christianity is, is uh, not just a set of beliefs. It's not uh, just a, 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 a lot of moral codes of right and wrong. It's not an experience we feel. Christianity is knowing God. That's what Christianity is. It is knowing God. It is not just knowing the facts about God. It's not just knowing the stories about God. It is knowing God. It's having a personal relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's having a personal relationship with the God who spoke the universe into existence. It's having a personal relationship with our Creator, the one who has given us life. Knowing God means being in a relationship with God. I know Carissa, my wife, not because I know facts about her. I know her age I don't know her weight, but I know her age. I know where she grew up. I, I know what makes her mad. I know what makes her happy. Uh, I know Carissa, not just because I know many stories about Carissa. I know Carissa because I'm in a relationship with Carissa. We talk. We sniggle. We kayak together. We are in a relationship. 
what Jesus Christ did when he arose from the dead is he says it is possible for you to have a relationship with God because he is the living savior. He arose from the dead and he's alive and he can be right here with us today. I think this is what Paul was thinking about in Philippians 3:10 when he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. When I read these words of, of Paul, I picture him in a group setting and, and people are going around in a, in a circle. This is before social distancing. And, and they begin to share their goals in life, their dreams in life. Maybe one guy stands up and says, hi, my name is John and I desire to be a millionaire. Maybe it goes on to the next person and a lady named Karen stands up and says, hi, my name is Karen and I want to be a movie star. Eventually, it comes around to the Apostle Paul. He stands up and he quotes his life passion, his life goal, his, his only bucket list item, and is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He's saying, I want to know him. I want to have a close relationship with Almighty God. Beyond buying something, beyond having the nicest house, a nice, the nice car, beyond living in, a, in an exotic place, I want to know Christ. I want a close relationship with Jesus Christ, and I want to know the same power that lifted him out of the grave. I want that power in my life so that when I face temptations, that I know Jesus is close to me and the power that lifted him out of the grave is operating in my life. So that when I face fear, I know that Jesus is close to me and the same power that lifted him out of the grave is operating in my life. That when I face a trial, and I'm overwhelmed and I'm frustrated that I know Jesus is close to me and the same power that lifted him out of the grave is operating in my life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, this is not possible without the resurrection because the resurrection is the linchpin that, that connects you and I to a relationship with God because we serve a living Savior. He is our living hope, and, and He's a Savior that lives inside of us, empowers us, and transforms us. The meaning of the resurrection is that we can know God. God is not a, a million miles away and he just wound up earth and said, good luck. Because of the resurrection, he walks with us. He talks with us. We know him. He goes with us. He says he will never leave us nor forsake us. And that's all possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I come to our, uh, chapter six in the journey from fear to faith. And when we come to chapter 6, this is where you and I become a part of this journey. You and I become a part of this story. And it's our response to the resurrection. There is a response to the resurrection. We can't just say, yeah, Jesus arose from the dead. That's nice. And move on. If Jesus, after being tortured, being beat, and being crucified, a spear placed into his side and buried in a tomb and came fully alive, you got to respond to that. There is a response that is required. You know, when I occasionally clean the house, as soon as Carissa walks into the house, I expect some kind of response. I expect cartwheels. I expect something that she notices it's clean. I expect something other than her saying, who are you and what have you done with my husband? I expect some type of response. You know, if you're going to lose weight, there's requirements. There's certain kind of responses you have to make in order to lose weight. Here's two of the most important ones. Number one, you got to exercise. And number two, remove the refrigerator during quarantine. That you can't be in the house with a refrigerator. I've seen some uh, funny pictures on Facebook through, uh, through our isolation. And uh, here's one, Batman after quarantine. Uh, wow, I feel like uh, him right now. I'm eating like crazy. Or here's one, me after I ate all of my quarantine snacks in one night. I don't know if you feel like that or not, but uh, that's not gonna, there's not gonna help us. And there's a, there, if you're going to lose weight, there's a required response. You gotta exercise, you gotta eat right. 
I love this dad. He, his shirt is uh, D-A-D-D. Dads against daughters dating. I think that's a great shirt. Uh, but he has requirements if you're going to date his daughter. The first requirement, if you pull up into my driveway and honk, you better be delivering a package because you're sure not picking up anything. I love that. Second of all, bring her home late and there's no next date. Thirdly, you make her cry, I make you cry. These are the rules of dating his daughter. Well, when you come to the resurrection, there is a required response. God is is not silent on the response he wants us to make according to the resurrection. And and, uh, no one can become a follower of Jesus Christ on their own terms, that they say, this is how I'm going to respond to God. Jesus Christ clearly says, here are the responses. There's two responses to the resurrection. Number one, we must repent of our sins. And second of all, we must have faith in Jesus Christ. The first response is repent of our sins and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Mark chapter one, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And throughout the New Testament, it talks about repenting and believing, repenting and have faith. Listen to Acts chapter 26. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity doesn't have a hundred steps in order to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Christianity doesn't have classes you have to go through. Uh, It's simple that you repent of your sins and you place your faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to a specific place. You don't have to make a pilgrimage to a certain city. You can right where you're at, place your faith in Jesus Christ and repent of your sins. So let's look at these two responses. The first one is to repent of your sins. In the New Testament, repentance is mentioned over 70 times. It's not a sideline issue. It is front and center. The importance of you and I owning up to our sins, acknowledging that we have sinned against God and repenting. Now, in today's culture, we have turned repenting into just a feeling of sorrow. Repentance goes beyond feeling sorry for our sins. It includes that, but it goes beyond that. A definition of repentance is repentance is to change the direction of one's life away from sin and toward righteousness. It's an, it's an action we part participate in. It it begins with the emotion of sorrow for our sins, but it continues with changing in the direction of our life. Now, all of us have a little lawyer in our mind that when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, that little lawyer comes up into our mind and tells us that, hey, my client is not that bad. My client doesn't need to repent. My client is is a good person. They're okay. The Holy Spirit, if it convicts us of sins, we need to repent and say, God, forgive me. I not only feel sorrow for my sin, but I turn, I change. And repentance has to have that element there. Repentance means we are no longer at peace with sin in our life. We are no longer allowing peace to just, I mean, mean, sin to settle down in our life and we get comfortable with it. We are at war against the things that are disobedient to God, the attitudes that are disobedient to God, the actions that are disobedient to God, that we declare war on sin in our life. Will we sin after we accept Jesus Christ? Yes, we're human. We will fail. But we, at that point, repent of our sins. We turn to God and we say, God, forgive me, God. I have sinned against you. And then we begin to work on uh, getting that sin out of our life. Repentance is the first response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second response that God requires of, of us is faith. Faith is an active trust in Jesus for life and for salvation. So we turn from sin in repentance and we resolve by God's strength to forsake sin. And then we turn to Jesus Christ 
in faith, relying on Jesus for salvation. Faith is an active trust uh, in Jesus Christ. It's a belief that says that, that I believe what he says and I'm going to trust him. As John 3.16 says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a belief in Jesus Listen to this quote, the Christian's faith isn't a leap into the dark. It is well-placed trust in the light of the world, Jesus. It is placing our faith in the light of the world, Jesus Christ. You see, we've been saved by grace, but faith is the hand that reaches up and receives the gift of grace, receives the gift of forgiveness, receives love. Faith is a 100% investment of all that I am, my hope, my dreams, my past, my present, my future into uh, the hands of the Lord and my 100% belief that Jesus Christ lived, he died, he rose again, and he is the source of life here and the source of eternal life. I place my faith in Jesus Christ, the light of the world. So we've looked at the disciples' journey from fear to faith. Now I want to look at our journey and ask ourselves, do we believe this? Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 11. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's Jesus asking us, do we believe this? Do we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do we believe that Jesus Christ is a source of life here and eternal life? In response to the resurrection, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I challenge you to commit to laying down all your fears and just living in faith of Jesus Christ. Place your faith in him F.B. Meyer put it this way, faith puts Christ between you and circumstances so you can't see circumstances. I think too many times we put our circumstances right up close and we stare at what's going on. I think we need to put uh, circumstances on the other side of Christ and we look at Christ and circumstances are on the other side. That's what faith is. Faith is putting Christ in front of our circumstances and we worship and we praise him. That's one of the reasons why we sing songs to the Lord is we're moving Christ in front of the circumstances of life and we're exalting Jesus Christ and we're honoring him. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I challenge you today, this weekend, Resurrection Weekend, is to look at Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him, your trust in him, and allow him to remove fear, anxiety, discouragement, a feeling of, of, of angst, depression out of your heart and let faith arise in your life second of all if you're not a follower of christ make the decision to repent and believe in jesus christ today if you're not a follower of christ i challenge you to repent of your sins and to believe in jesus christ that is the appropriate response that these two elements are the required response that God requires of us. If we want to know God, if we want to be in a relationship with God, we cannot write our own terms. God has clearly connected repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, that he has joined together repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I challenge you to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ. I challenge you to become righteous through Christ. I challenge you to ask him to forgive you of your sins. I challenge you to put your trust fully in him. You might say, how do I do that? It's through talking to him. It's through prayer. And what I'd like to do is lead you in a prayer. As you sit there in your living room or wherever you're at, wherever you're listening or watching this, if you wanna become a follower of Jesus Christ, you wanna repent of your sins, and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you just bow your heads with me? And in fact, I'd like everyone to just bow their heads. As I pray this prayer, would you just pray this with me? Lord Jesus, 
I know that I am a sinner and I am sorry for my sin. I turn and I repent of my sins right now. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and paying the price for my sin. Please come into my heart and life right now. Fill me with your spirit and help me to be a lifelong follower of you. Thank you for forgiving me and coming into you, my life. I place my faith solely in you. I trust in you for life now and for eternal life. God, I pray for those that prayed that prayer from their heart, that you will strengthen them, that you will walk with them, that you will encourage them, that you will build them up. I pray you will strengthen them as they walk in your word. Now let's all pray together. Father, I pray for every person listening in Jesus' name, that you will bless them. Bless every single person, every married person, every senior adult, every young person. I pray, God, that you will give them an amazing day today with family. I pray, God, that you will bless their family. You will bless their businesses. Protect those who have lost their job or their hours have been cut. I pray you will prosper them. I pray you will lead and guide each person. I pray this time of isolation would be moments of transformation where we draw closer to you. We spend more time in prayer. We spend time reading your word. And that God, when we get through this, we will look back and see it as some tremendous time with family and with you, God. Protect every person here. I pray again for frontline workers, those in the medical field, protect them. I pray, God, those that have coronavirus, that you would heal them in Jesus' name. I pray you will bring this, this uh, virus to an end, that you will kill this virus. Protect your people, Lord. Bless our family, Family Worship Center. Bless them in their homes throughout our community, God. Give them a great day today as they celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you so much for listening today. I'd love to see you today. I so look forward to seeing you. I miss you like everything. Chris and I love you. If you prayed that prayer to become a follower of Jesus Christ, or maybe you just need someone to pray with you, you need uh, someone to uh, call you, would you go to fwc.life forward slash follow and just put your name and phone number there. We'd love to reach out to you to see how we can help you. If you've recently accepted Christ, read the Gospel of John. Uh, it is such an encouraging book to build your faith up. God bless you. Uh, we love you, and we will see you soon. God bless.